Welcome to part two. In this video, we're gonna discuss one of the biggest deal killers that I see far too many new land investors getting themselves roped into. What's going on guys? My name is Sumner Healy, founder at landinvestor.co. In the last 18 months, I've sold a little over $2.2 million of raw land on the internet. I make these videos to document my journey and hopefully help others along the way. So in the last video, we went over legal access. Now that you've verified that the property does have legal access, we need to move on to the second portion, which we call physical access. Now, unfortunately, a title company is not going to be able to help suss out if the property does or doesn't have physical access. So this is really going to come down to doing your own due diligence. You might be saying, Sumner, what the heck is physical access? Well, in a lot of cases in the land investing business, we're buying properties that are incredibly rural. I'm talking like three to four hours outside of any major metropolitan area. And as you can imagine, a lot of these rural properties don't get a lot of traffic out there. And a lot of these roads are going to be dirt or gravel roads. And depending on where you're buying land at, you can have some crazy undulating topography. And so if you factor all of those things in together, rural with very little traffic, gravel or dirt road, undulating topography, that can make a property that does have legal access damn near impossible to cross. And we call that physical access. How easy is it to physically actually go and visit the property? And so when we're looking at a property and we verified, yes, it does have physical access, there's a couple of things running through my mind. I know the more rural it is, the more difficult it's going to be to show the property and have people go and visit it. And we know in our process, visiting is the last step in our sales funnel to actually guarantee that, hey, we're moving in the right direction in terms of getting a sale. So what we look at is how long of a dirt road is it on? It's not really a question of if it's on a dirt road, it's pretty much a guarantee that it is a dirt road in this business. But if it's 40 miles of a dirt road versus two miles of dirt road, that's an entirely different story. The next thing we look at is undulating topography. Is it going over mountains? Is it in a valley? Is it flat? Is it level? Is it a big wash? Now those variances can make a huge impact on how easy it is to get to the property. One of the biggest things that we're looking at are washes, especially in the Southwest where we do a lot of business. It can make a property dang near impossible to cross at certain points in the year. It can also make those roads just really snarled and gnarly because you're gonna have a lot of water passing through at least a few times per year, which is gonna eat out the roads and really make them pretty difficult to pass. The next thing we look at is adjacent lots. And what I mean by adjacent lots is, is there anyone else that's living out there full time? Is there any development out there? If there is, you can one, assume that people are driving that road on a regular basis. The other thing that you can assume is potentially they are gonna be doing maintenance on the road themselves. Even if these are county maintained roads, if they're way out in the sticks, you can pretty much guarantee that the county is not doing any work on them. And so usually what will happen is the folks that live in proximity to that road and they use it often, they'll end up doing the work on the road themselves. This is actually very familiar for me. I grew up in Big Sur, California. We had a gnarly road up Partington Ridge, which is on the south coast of Big Sur, that would lead up to our house. It was about a 10 to 12 mile dirt road and what we'd have to do is once a year after the rainy season, everyone that lived up on the ridge would go and actually work on the road together. If we didn't, it would be essentially impassable after the rainy season. So a lot of the same stuff is happening with these owners that live on these rural properties. The next thing we need to look at is seasonality, right? If this is in Southern Colorado in the mountains, you can assume that in the winter and the spring, it's gonna be pretty much impossible to pass if it's at a certain elevation. On the flip side, if this is in San Bernardino County in California, for example, you can assume that you can pretty much access this property any time of year. Now, if you're dealing with properties that are gonna have limited access for a portion of the year, you want to make sure that you're mindful of when you're doing your acquisitions on these properties. For example, if I'm buying land in Southern Colorado and it's over you know, 10,000 feet in elevation, I'll start doing my acquisitions towards the middle to the tail end of spring, knowing that I'm gonna be listing those properties in the summer. What I wouldn't wanna do is start my acquisitions in the fall and list them in the dead of winter. That's gonna be really, really difficult to sell unless it's priced right. And by priced right, I mean at the point where someone's just gonna buy it sight unseen, which if the property is cheap enough, that does happen. Now, one of the worst situations to find yourself in is when you sell a property that say it's on owner financing terms and someone bought it sight unseen, and then they go to drive out there for the first time six months later, only to find out that it's damn near impossible to access the property. That's a really tough conversation to have. So what we're doing on the front end anytime we get a new deal is once we verify that it does have legal access, we're always gonna send a scout to go visit the property. And what we have a lot of our scouts do is one, they're gonna take field notes on their experience of going to visit the property, what the road condition was like, what the entire journey was like as a whole. And then for the ones that do have access to a GoPro, we'll have them strap a GoPro to the front of their car. They'll record the entire drive. And so what we'll do one is we will go and rewatch that footage just so we can get our own read on what the quality of the road conditions are like. The other thing that we'll do is we'll actually fast forward 
record and compress that video. So if it's a 40 minute video, we'll shave it down to you know, four minutes or five minutes and speed it up. And then we'll create directions. And so we can pass off that directional video to anyone that wants to go visit the property, whether they're gonna use it for directions themselves or they just wanna use it for context to understand what it's like to actually drive out to the property. And most photographers will do this free of charge or they'll do it for a little bit of money as long as you're wrapping it into a total project for like drone videos or boots on the ground type photos of the property. So that scout is also going to double as typically our drone photographers. So they'll get drone videos, they'll get drone photos of the property, and then they'll get that driving video as well as field notes when headed to the property. The other thing that you can use is Google Earth, and you can kind of pan around and get a 3D perspective of what the roads look like. You can get a perspective of what the topography is like. It's not perfect, but it's a step in the right direction for certain. One of the best indicators that we've used is simply just looking at if there's any development in the area, if there's other neighbors that live out there. That's going to give you a good sense of if the roads are passed. The next thing that we look at is trying to see if we can find any recent listings or recent sales in the area, see if they make any mention about road condition or what it's like accessing the property. We'll also go and look at their pictures before we have our own pictures. The third thing is if it's in a POA or an HOA, typically they will actually maintain the roads. Even if it's incredibly rural, a lot of times the annual dues will just go to road maintenance. And so if that's the case that you're in, you can feel pretty confident that the road conditions will be pretty good. Now, if this is not in an HOA or a POA and this is just rural land out in the sticks, you really want to ensure that you are getting someone out there to go visit the property before you close on it. And that's it guys. I think this is some of the nuance that a lot of people miss when they're first getting started in this business. And truth be told, I think it's incredibly easy to run comps. It's pretty formulaic. What's not easy is to read between the lines, to identify legal access, and then more so to actually understand, is it physically accessible? So I see a lot of folks, including myself when I started, that will you know go comp a property. It's, it makes sense. The offer is right, it's assessed well, the comps are looking good out there. You're just thinking to yourself, I've got a freaking deal, but you haven't A, verified if it does have legal access and B, maybe if you did verify it does have legal access, you haven't verified that it actually has strong physical road access. So make sure you are checking both those boxes before you move forward with any acquisition in this business. I appreciate you guys so much for watching this video. If you found value in it, give it a thumbs up, drop a comment down below. Be sure to subscribe as we are dropping a ton of new free land investing videos every week. See you guys in the next video.